Okay, hello everybody. Right, so, hello. Okay, so basically I plan to give this lecture in English. Okay, so I should be uh, recording it and when I get around to it, I'll put it up on my YouTube channel. Uh, what else have I got to say? Yeah, I had a big bad surprise this morning. I had a flat tire on my bike, so I had to rush back home, jump in my car and drive here to be on time. Um, okay, so uh, I think the my, my, my job here this morning is to tell you about the anti-infectious immune response. And I think probably everybody has got a good background in immunology already, right? So I'm not going to talk too much about uh, you know, things I think I hope everybody knows, you know, what, you know, how the T cells recognize antigens, what are antibodies, what's antigen presentation, this kind of stuff. But I do want to talk about uh, you know, the different phases of an anti-infectious immune response. And I'll try and mix up uh, different types of pathogens and what are the kind of uh, effector mechanisms that are important for different types of pathogens. Okay, so that, that's really my objective today. So, right, so, you know, we're all in touch, uh, in contact with microorganisms and we're all getting infected from time to time and after an infection well one of several things can, can happen um, so this is uh, quite an interesting i think an informative uh, diagram from uh, 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 abul abbas's uh, textbook which i just copied down here so basically what is going to happen straight after infection is the first thing that uh, pathogens have got to do is colonize you. They've got to colonize the host. And if they manage that, then they'll start to grow exponentially. Okay, so you've got to imagine that, you know, this is the number of microbes on a, on a log scale. You know, bacteria, when they grow, they're doubling every well, hour or so. Viruses will have exponential growth as well. So once pathogens colonize you, they're going to start growing exponentially. So you're going to have a growth phase over time. And initially, this isn't really going to provoke any symptoms. So every infectious disease has got an incubation period, which is defined as the lapse of time between the initial infection and the first symptoms. Now, so, so that's what happens here. And once you start getting symptoms, then that means your body has noticed there's some kind of pathogen in there and is starting to react. Now, after this point, there's one of, you know, several things can happen. Uh, basically, if you don't have any immune system, what is going to happen is that this, uh, this bacterial or viral growth will just continue on an exponential growth curve and then, you know, you'll probably be killed. So, you know, uh, that, that's an unfavorable outcome. Uh, what actually you, your immune system exists for is to ensure that this doesn't happen. So that uh, after the, uh, the emergence of symptoms initially, you'll have, you know, some kind of symptomatic phase then your immune system kicks in and will eradicate the pathogen, whatever it is. And so that's basically, you know, that's a win. That's a win for the host. Uh, the other end of the scale is, you know, you get infected, you get severely ill and you die. That's a win for the pathogen, I guess. And another situation which can occur is kind of like a draw. Okay, so uh, you never manage to uh, eradicate the uh, pathogen and you get a persistent uh, illness, um, either chronic or latent. So infections like uh, HIV, herpes viruses, also persistent bacterial infections like uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, 
they've got this kind of uh, long-term uh, infection, which is persistent and it's very, very difficult to eradicate these types of um, infections. Um, another thing that is also a kind of a win for the host is where you get infected, but you don't actually have any uh, overt symptoms. So as we know, you know, with COVID-19, uh, there's quite a high proportion of infections were uh, and still are asymptomatic. So this is a kind of problem for disease control because if you can't identify everyone who is infected, it makes it difficult to limit the, the expansion of the, of the epidemic. But it's really, you know, it's uh, the best possible case for your immune system. If you can uh, eliminate, the, detect and eliminate pathogens without any disease, that is actually, you know, that's the perfect functioning of your immune system here. And I suppose this is really what you want to obtain by vaccination. Okay, so you might want, you might be able to prevent any kind of colonization from occurring. That's you know, the optimal case. But if you get infected, then actually if you've been vaccinated and you can have an asymptomatic infection, that's also a you know, pretty good outcome. Um, so that, that's how infectious diseases progress. And uh, that's what the aim of your immune response is, is to like get to this situation and not to die. So the time scale here is going to be what? Okay, so for localized infections like flu virus or something like that, you maybe have two or three days of uh, incubation period. Your symptomatic phase might be one week or something, and then maybe two, and then that's it, you know. Uh, for something much more pathogenic, like hemorrhagic uh, Ebola fever, then you have a longer incubation period, maybe 10 days, two weeks, and then you get much more severe symptoms, and you know, over the next two or three weeks, either you die or you, or you get better. Okay, so one other thing I just wanted to touch on, but I'm not gonna talk about this really much more, is, uh, you know, the colonization phase. So most infections start at a uh, mucous membrane, so the mucosa. And just to kick off an infection, any type of pathogen has got to be able to colonize the mucosa. And there are a fair number of, you know, simple barriers that prevent or reduce the probability of colonization. So you've got, you know, mechanical epithelial cell barriers, uh, chemical barriers um, that are at mucosa. And then also things, something that's really important is the uh, microbiome. Okay, so uh, we've got a uh, microbiome in our, you know, buccal cavity, in the gastrointestinal tract on the skin, in the upper respiratory tract. And the bacteria that, well, bacteria mostly that live uh, are, on our or in contact with our mucosa are really helping us as part of the first line of defense against colonization by pathogens. And there's maybe two or three different mechanisms. So one of them is just the uh, microbiome will be occupying the niche. Okay, so they're just so many of them, they just take up all the space. The other thing is that, um, well, yeah, so the other, another mechanism that's also important is that some of these uh, commensal bacteria are actually producing antimicrobial compounds like bacteriocins and some types of antibiotics. So lactic acid bacteria and enterobacteria can produce anti well, bacteriocins that will kill other bacteria and can have a, a, an impact on controlling colonization by pathogenic bacteria. Okay, so I'm not really want to I don't really want to talk about these things today, but you know it, it's the important first line of defense, the epithelial barrier and simple physical chemical and biological barriers that really help us to avoid getting infected. However, 
if that barrier gets broken down, what's the next thing that's going to happen? So I'm, the rest of the talk is going to be concentrating on these three things, okay? Pathogen sensing. How do you even know that you've been infected? Then I'm going to talk a little bit about innate responses and then adaptive responses. Okay, so that, that, that's the plan here. Now, with respect to uh, pathogen sensing, how do you know if you're infected? Well, this is kind of related to uh, the basic, or one of the basic concepts of the immune system is its capacity to distinguish self from non-self. And this is an important feature of both the innate and the adaptive system. But in order to engage any type of immune response, you have to have some kind of pathogen sensing that already can distinguish biological material from a pathogen from biological material that is part of your own body. So that's the kind of utility of the pathogen recognition receptors, the PRRs, that uh, are, are essential for starting up any kind of anti-infectious immune response. Now, depending on the type of pathogen, they may or may not have particular biochemical signatures that can be detected by PRRs. So, you know, bacteria, they've got a characteristic biochemical components in their cell wall, cell wall, for example, or outer, cell, outer membranes. So you've got things like uh, LPS, peptidoglycan, a lot of manans that are distinctive signatures of bacterial biochemistry. And these can be detected by PRRs. The same thing for fungi, okay, so beta glucans, manans, found on fungi, not found on uh, uh, our own cells. Parasites is a bit more difficult, so um, protozoan parasites, of course, they're eukaryotic cells. They don't have a rigid cell wall like uh, fungi. So their basic biochemistry is the same as a mammalian cell, but their outer cell layer does have some kind of uh, specificities to it. So, um, for example, trypanosome parasites, the outside of them is covered with a dense layer of glycophosphatidyl-inositile-linked proteins, GPI-linked proteins. And for example, I think this is on uh, Leishmania parasites, the outer surface is composed of uh, let me just get this right, lipophosphoglycan. So these are particular structures that are on the outside of uh, these parasites that you don't find in you know, mammalian cells. And there are, and these are a target to be picked up by pathogen recognition receptors, PRRs. Now viruses, they have a, that, that's, that's a different kind of problem because virus particles are produced by our own cells. So all of their biochemistry, their glycoproteins, their proteins, they're exactly the same biochemically as you know, what we have making up our own body components. So all of the detection of virus infection is really based on the presence of uh, nucleic acid in the wrong place in the cell, in the wrong type of, in the wrong compartment, or slight differences in the structure of nucleic acids. So the wrong type of nucleic acids are in the wrong place at the wrong time. So it, that's the, the principles of, of pathogen recognition by PRRs. And there are uh, five types of PRRs. I'm going to go and uh, explain to you afterwards. So there's uh, um, these ones here. Okay, so five families that are doing different things and respond to different types of pathogens. So I'm going to talk about the uh, C-type lectin-like receptors, the CLRs. 
So uh, lectin-like, okay, lectins are proteins that bind to glycans. So their function is to recognize specific glycans. They're expressed on the surface of myeloid cells. And many of them can stimulate uh, phagocytosis and activate mononuclear phagocytes. So many of them, by which I mean these ones here that are in uh, orange or red, and they can activate mononuclear phagocytes because the CLR is associated either with, for example, the FC gamma receptor signaling chain here. So this can like mediate signaling or another signaling adapter protein, or they have an ITAM motif in uh, the intracellular Re uh, domain of, of the protein. So the ones that are going to activate uh, uh, an anti-infectious immune response are these ones, okay, Dectin-1, Dectin-2, Minko, Tec5A, and, the, and this one here. So what are they recognizing? So Dectin-1 is specific for beta-glucans, Minko recognizes some kind of glycolipids and uh, the other ones that they, they all seem to be like recognizing some kind of manan so manos on the surface of glycosylated structures is very important i'm going to talk a little bit about one or two of these so dectin one the gene name is clec 7a uh, this is the one that is perhaps the easiest to understand because it's specific for uh, beta 1 to 3 glucans. So it's glucose linked beta 1 to 3 with another glucose molecule. And this is specifically found in the, on the outer coat of fungi and in some bacteria. So this kind of glycosidic linkage is not found in any mammalian glycan. So it's a specific chemical bond or type of disaccharide that's recognized by Dictin-1. What is kind of interesting about this is that it's uh, Dictin-1 only seems to be activated by a particular antigen. So if you give uh, you know, a yeast cell to a mononuclear phagocyte, dendritic cell or a macrophage expressing Dictin-1, then the yeast cell will bind to several molecules of Dictin-1 and this will activate the signaling cascade and activate phagocytosis of the particle and increase the expression of you know, genes under the control of NF-kappa B. So IL-6, IL-23, IL-12 and the uh, precursor of interleukin-1-beta. So all of that is going to stimulate Th1 and Th17 type immune responses. Okay, so, if, so particulate antigen, and if you give a soluble beta-glucan, you don't really get much activation. You've got to have like complete yeast cells or uh, conidia. Now, uh, the importance of Dectin-1, and I'm going to do this kind of through the lecture, is try and illustrate some of these molecules with what we know from human genetics. I'm not going to do really very much mouse stuff because there's too much, but I am going to try and illustrate with examples from uh, human uh, immunology. So the importance of Dectin-1 really for you know, human immune responses was shown uh, when a family with uh, um, an autosomal recessive mutation in Dictin-1 was identified in 2009. So you had this family with uh, three uh, girls who had uh, carried this mutation uh, in a homozygous state and each parent was heterozygous for this particular mutation which caused a, I think a stop codon at the, in the C-terminal domain of the protein. So the C-terminus is on the outside that's the carbohydrate recognition domain. So proteins may be expressed, but it can't bind to carbohydrates anymore. Can't bind to uh, beta glucans. So these three girls had a, had the mutation at the homozygous state. So what what were the symptoms associated with that? Well, 
when they got cells from these people, from PBMC, gave them uh, uh, yeast cells to, uh, to, to, to stimulate their mononuclear phagocytes. Well, in terms of biological response, the two parents, okay, they had a lower than normal. And for the three uh, children here, like no response at all to uh, uh, yeast cells. So they're functionally uh, incapable of, uh, of, of, of uh, responding. And what they had was they had uh, recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. So they had candida infections at their vagina mucosa that didn't uh, resolve. And they also had a persistent uh, onico on onychomycosis. So these are like uh, fungal infections around the nails and your fingers, either on the hands or the feet. So if you don't have Dectin-1, then that's what happens to you, okay? You can't really resist colonization infection by these very, very common fungal pathogens. So that, that's why we know this is really important. A similar type of receptor is Dectin-2. And uh, here, you know, it's one of the first ones we're, we're going to see that's uh, really binding to mannose. So the structure that's recognized here is, you know, two mannose sugars bound to each other with an alpha-1-2 linkage. And you find that in a lot of fungal cell walls, uh, a lot of mycobacterial outer surface polymers. So LAM is lipoarabino manan, which forms, it's, you know, if you can visualize mycobacterial membranes, think first about gram-negative membranes. You've got the outer membrane with LPS, right, in gram-negatives. In mycobacteria, you don't have LPS, but you've got an outer membrane, and the outer part of it is composed of this stuff. Lipoarabino manans with a lot of mannose that's on the external part of them. So, what is perhaps a bit special about Dectin 2 is it can bind the internal manan alpha 1, alpha 2 dimers so they don't have to be like right at the end of the polymer. And this kind of structures they, bound, they bind are illustrated here. So, here you've got a kind of diagram of the different types of mannose polymers in uh, yeast pathogens, different candida species here. Saccharomyces are here as well, they've got manans, and some bacterial pathogens down here. So each green circle here is a mannose molecule, and the direction of the, well, the way they're, you know, if they're vertical, then this is an alpha one to two bond. So all of these yeast manans that are present on the outside of the, the yeast particles, They've got a lot of these mannose alpha 1 to 2 structures here. And you also find that in O antigens, LPS O antigens from some gram negative bacteria. And you get the same short mannose alpha 1 to 2 in these mycobacterium tuberculosis, well, at the end of the lipoarabino manan structure. So it's these three molecules here, okay? So Dictin-2 is binding to quite a wide array, array of pathogens, okay? And now, one of the things that I always found a little bit difficult to understand about all this mano stuff is that if you remember your biochemistry of N-linked glycoproteins, everybody remember that? Okay, so what are the three types of structures on N-linked glycoproteins? Okay, you've got complex, hybrid, and oligomanos, high manos glycans on N-linked glyco glycoproteins. So what you have on these oligomano structures, you've got the same manos alpha one to two bond. So I've always been thinking, ah, why, why are these kind of receptors specific for pathogens? Well, it's because on mature mammalian glycoproteins, Pretty much all of these oligomanose structures are mature, they're processed, and in fact on the outside of a mature glycoprotein, you have very, very small amounts of uh, oligo or high mannose glyco glycans. So most of them are matured into these complex or these hybrid forms, 
where the mannose alpha one to two residues are like uh, are, are, are removed and replaced by some other glycan structure, often terminating in sialic acid. Okay, so most of our glycoproteins don't really contain these alpha one to two mannose structures. Now, uh, dictin two uh, has a signaling pathway a little bit different from dictin one, apparently. So, because it's relying on the FC gamma receptor signaling, uh, well, subunit, and the result is that it's only going to induce the expression of IL twenty three and IL one beta. So, it's more uh, specifically inducing TH seventeen type immunity. Okay, now maybe the last one of these uh, CLRs is uh, Minko, also an interesting molecule. Um, so this one is, was um, identified as firstly as a receptor for mycobacterium tuberculosis cord factor. So that's this kind of uh, uh, glycolipid molecule here. So you've got two big long uh, fatty acid chains, and they're bound together with this glucose alpha-1, alpha-1 structure, which is trehalos. And that's also very specific. We don't have any trehalos in our bodies, only exists in microbes. However, Minko also seems to bind to some other kind of structures from different pathogens. So uh, these, these fungal glycolipids here from, I mm, can't remember which pathogen, maybe candida, and also uh, glucosal ceramide from dead cells can activate Minko. So Minko is kind of, you know, it's, the, 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 these sugars are important. There's a sugar binding pocket on, on, on the Minko uh, CLR. So it's, it's a lectin. It needs these sugars to be activated. But it's not only specific for this trihalose. So it's some kind of small sugar bound to a lipid molecule. It seems to be binding. It seems to be activating uh, Minko. And once again, if you activate Minko, then you get activation of NF kappa B and expression of secretion of IL 12, expression of IL 1 beta, IL 6, IL 23, TH1 and TH17 immunity. Now, one of the things that's in common with the signaling pathways of all these CLRs is this adapter protein card nine. Okay, so this is the important thing here. All of them are signaling through card nine. Now, once again, there have been some genetic, uh, well, congenital deficiencies in card nine uh, detected in different families. So well, 2009, there was a publication of an Iranian family with a history of uh, uh, chronic invasive candidiasis and uh, you know if you have a look at this family here these are some of the index cases uh, these people here also had card 9 mutation at the homozygous state uh, how does this happen well look this is this is a first cousin marriage here okay and then these two families also are quite closely related so you know the reason you get these very rare mutations cropping up in a homozygous state is often you've got some kind of consanguinity in the family so invasive candidiasis is more severe form, okay? It's more severe. And uh, in fact, after this uh, first publication, there's been confirmation of a lot of other mutations in CARD9 associated with invasive fungal infections. So why is this more severe compared to Dectin-1 mutations? Well, if you've got a Dectin-1 mutation, which is knocking out the function of Dectin-1, well, you still have a functional Minko, Dictin 2, the other CLRs. So you don't have a complete absence of detection of fungal pathogens. But if you lack in CARD9, all of these CLRs will not function. Okay, so that's why it's a more severe phenotype. Okay, so that's CARD9. Next one that I guess everybody knows already are the toll-like receptors, the TLRs. Um, 
Okay, so what is specific about them is that their extracellular domain is composed of multiple leucine rich repeat units, which form a kind of hook structure. And these LRR domains are the ones that are going to be binding specifically to some kind of pathogen associated molecular pattern. And they all signal through the same adapter molecule, which is mid-88, which is essential for the signaling of all the TLRs except for TLR3. So there are a bunch of them that are located on the outside of mononuclear phagocytes, TLR1, 2, TLR4, and TLR5. And there are several of them which are endosomal. TLR3, 7, 8, and 9, and also TLR4 is present in an endosomal form. So the structures of the LRR domain combined with a particular pathogen molecule that's involved in, that they recognize, has been resolved for you know, pretty much all of these uh, TLRs. So you can see that actually the functional form that is recognizing a particular molecule is a dimer. Okay, so somehow the presence of the uh, pathogen associated molecular pattern, some kind of molecule associated with the pattern, pathogen, is going to induce or stabilize the dimerization. And that's how the signaling starts, the signaling cascade starts. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about. TLR4 and then TLR2, and then I'm going to switch to the intracellular one, the endosomal ones. So TLR4, big classic toll-like receptor, it's activated by LPS. However, as every microbiologist knows, well, let's say uh, if LPS is formed of three different domains. You've got the uh, o antigens, uh, which are on the outside of gram negative bacteria. So these are repeating patterns of glycans, repeated glycan motifs. Then you've got the core polysaccharide, which is more or less uh, conserved. And then these are all anchored into the outer bacterial membrane by uh, lipid A. Now, what everybody knows is that, you know, these parts here are highly variable between strains. So the part of LPS that is recognized by TLR4 is the conserved part, which is the lipid A uh, moiety, the part of the molecule. So this is, this, this is conserved, and as you go out from the core part here, the structure of LPS becomes more and more variable. So it's no good to have a pattern recognition receptor that's binding to something that's going to be different even between different serotypes of the same species. You have to recognize something that's conserved. And that's why LPS is specific for lipid A. But that raises a problem, okay, because lipid A isn't really accessible on the surface of the bacteria. So TLR4 can't actually bind to a gram-negative bacterium that's intact, okay? It's only binding to LPS that has somehow been released from bacteria, from gram-negative bacteria. Now, LPS isn't actually an um, easily soluble molecule because it's got these very long uh, lipid, uh, branched, uh, lipid chains here. So if it's released into the plasma or the extracellular space, it's going to form these micelles with the lipid part all buried on the inside and the oligosaccharide part on the outside. And, that's, and, the, and there's a, a whole molecular system that exists in order to extract LPS from these micelles and load it onto TLR4. So TLR4 is not working on its own, okay? So the first step here, is for uh, uh, LPS binding protein, soluble serum protein, to bind to LPS micelles. Then CD14 is going to bind to this uh, complex. And somehow LBP will transfer one molecule of LPS to CD14. 
So CD14, as you might remember, is a very good specific marker of monocytes, macrophages in, on, the, on the cell surface, but it also exists as a soluble form. So there's soluble CD14 floating around in the plasma or extracellular you know, space. And then CD14 is what's going to deliver uh, LPS to TLR4, which can only function to bind LPS in conjunction with another protein, which is MD2. So how does, uh, and then once that happens, then you get the TLR4 MD2 dimerization, and that's what activates signaling. So, you know, recognition of LPS by TLR4, it's easy to remember, but there's, there's a complicated system that allows this to happen. Now, if you look a little bit more closely in how um, LPS and is binding to the MD2 TLR4 complex, what is really important are the kind of like grooves, the hydrophobic grooves that are there to bind all these six uh, acyl chains here. So this is why MD2 TLR4 is specific for LPS. LPS, the specific part of it is the lipid A. And what's specific about lipid A? It's got these six acyl chains. Right? And these six acyl chains are really necessary because this sixth one here has got a free hydrophobic region, which is what's going to bind to the second molecule of TLR4. That's what induces the dimerization. So this was kind of understood and led to the development of a lipid A analog with only four acyl chains. So this one can bind to TLR4 MD2, but it can't activate the signaling pathway. So everyone thought this is going to be great. It's going to be an antagonist and we can use it to treat sepsis. Because uh, if you've got a gram negative systemic infection, you'll have sepsis. And if we can block some of the act hyperactivation of the immune system, acting through TLR4, then maybe we can, uh, you know, stop people from dying. But unfortunately, this did not work. So it's a bit of a, well, you know, it's a great idea, but it just didn't work in, in, in the clinic. Okay, so that's TLR4. How about TLR2? Uh, so TLR2 is going to be uh, binding lipopeptides and lipoproteins. Uh, mostly from gram-positive bacteria, although some gram-negatives and some protozoa do also activate TLR2. Now, the main thing that seems to be essential here is the kind of diacylated uh, lipoproteins or lipopeptides. So, what does that mean? Okay, for gram-positive bacteria, the lipoproteins that they have, okay? So you've got the lipid part that's in the bacterial membrane, and then you've got the protein part that's on the outside of the cell. And they're connected with something that looks like a glycophosphatidyl at linkage. So you've got the protein, which is up here, and the uh, amino acid that's essential for binding to the, to, to, the, uh, to the glycerol here, which is gonna give you the fatty acid chain, is cysteine. So these are, uh, they, these are conserved, okay, in gram-positive bacteria. All the lipoproteins on the outside of the cell are bound to the diacyl or triacyl glycerol with this kind of like cysteine glycerol linkage. And that's the ligand for TLR1 or well, TLR2, either in complex with TLR1 or TLR6. So TLR6 is recognizing TLR2, TLR6, recognizing diacylated lipoproteins. TLR1, 2, recognizing triacylated lipoproteins. Now, there is also activation of TLR2 by glycophosphatidyl inositol linked lipoproteins on the outer surface of some parasites. So, uh, Leishmania. Uh, well, trypanosome, yeah, trypanosomes and mycobacterial lipoarabinomanan. So if you look at trypanosomes, on the outside of the parasite, the whole outer surface is covered with thousands of copies of the variable surface glycoprotein. So there's a very interesting story about antigenic variability in trypanosomes. 
So the outer part that's available for complement or antibody binding is very variable. But the glycophosphate down linkage that binds it to the membrane is conserved. And this is what's going to activate TLR2. Now there's a bit of a question in my mind anyway to try and understand how TLR2 can distinguish this kind of GPI-linked glycoprotein from a normal cellular GPI-linked glycoprotein. Because this structure here, okay, you've got the two like diacylglycerol here, inositol phosphate, then the, that is n acetyl -gluco glucosamine, and then the mannose structure. This is exactly the same as what you have in GPI-linked glycoprotein, except with some kind of modifications here. But this modification, this structure, doesn't really look very much like this one, which is which TLR2 recognizes in bacteria. So I think we don't know everything really, or don't understand everything about the way that TLR2, TLR2 can discriminate host and pathogen diacylated uh, lipoproteins. So I think it's a bit of a question there. However, one, one application of understanding this was the generation of synthetic TLR2 ligands, which are PAM2-CSK4 and PAM3-CSK4. So these small molecules are a new uh, adjuvant. Don't know if they're really used in commercially in vaccines yet, but they are used a lot experimentally. So specific <coughs> TLR2 agonists. Okay. Uh, also, yeah, I didn't really mention anything about this. TLR2, TLR4 signaling will generally give you activation of NF-kappa B and kind of secretion of IL-1, IL-6, IL-12, more Th1 type of, uh, immunity. Okay, and the last one to talk about here for TLRs are the endosomal TLRs. TLR3, 7, 8, 9, also TLR4, but 3, 7, 8, and 9, these are the ones that are going to be recognizing nucleic acids. So TLR3 uh, recognizes double-stranded RNA, 7 and 8 single-stranded RNA, and TLR9 DNA. Uh, TLR7, 8, and 9 recognize small fragments that have been cut up by RNases or DNAs too. And one thing that's very important is they are directed to the endosome. And this targeting depends on this molecule, UNC93B, UNC93B. So if you don't have any UNC93B, then you won't have any functional TLR3, 7, 8, or 9. Um, this endosomal targeting, also very important for the activation of these TLRs because all of them, the leucine-rich repeat domain, the LRR domain, is kind of cleaved in two to give the functional form. And this cleavage occurs by, or is, is performed by proteases in the endosome. So it seems to be very important that these TLRs don't bind or don't recognize any nucleic acids that are outside of the endosome. And I think that's really the key to their function and their specificity. Because, you know, we've got a bunch of, uh, we've got a bunch of, a whole lot of DNA and RNA floating around uh, and outside the cells. You'll have small fragments of DNA and RNA that have been digested by DNAs 1 and RNAs A in, in, in the plasma. But it's important that you don't actually get any, uh, uh, an inflammatory response to these small trace amounts of free nucleic acid that we, we might have. So what is important here is that these TLRs are only going to be activated by DNA or RNA that's contained in some kind of particle that is endocytosed, phagocytosed or endocytosed. So of course, any kind of RNA or DNA that is protected, that means it's in a virus particle or it could be in some kind of pathogen that's been phagocytosed or in a dead or dying cell. 
Okay, so what happens if you lack well, some of these receptors? So uh, if uh, so, there are, have been some cases of children identified with TLR3 uh, deficiency or UNC UNC-93B deficiency, and these seem to be uh, major factors in the development of herpes simplex virus encephalitis. So it's estimated that herpes simplex virus, HSV1 encephalitis, occurs in about one in 200,000 infections. It's a rare complication, but very, very serious. And it's related to the inability to sense this uh, viral nucleic acids. And other things that have been discovered more recently is that the same kind of mutations in TLR3 and also mutations in TLR7 are related to severe COVID-19. So once again, no inability to detect uh, viral nucleic acids leading to a more severe outcome of viral infections, okay? Okay, sticking with nucleic acids, there are intracellular receptors for nucleic acids. And I think, well, two or three families that we're gonna talk about. So the first of them are the RIG-I-like receptors, the RLRs. Now, uh, okay, the first one, where the family gets its name from is Rig I. So one of the things I always wondered about this, right, is, you know, is it supposed to be Rig 1 or Rig I? Because right? you kind of expect it to be like Rig 1, 2, 3 or whatever, but apparently everybody says Rig I. And I was kind of curious about this, so I thought, oh, let's see what the, the original person who described this gene, what did they call it, right? So I had a look, and it was actually first named in the PhD thesis of a Chinese doctoral student, right? And uh, so I've only got like the title in English and it's just like Rig I. So I have no idea whether this person wanted to call it Rig One or Rig I, but anyway, everybody says Rig I. So there are only three members of the Rig I-like receptors, Rig I, MDA5 and LGP2. So LGP2, its function seems to be to regulate the activity of the other two uh, members of the family. And Rig I and MDA5 both detect cytoplasmic RNA molecules. And their activation pathway uh, depends on this adapter molecule, which is called MAVS. So MAVS has got a card caspase activation and recruitment domain, which will interact with the card domains on Rig I and MDA5. So LGP2, well, combined RNA, but it can't actually, you know, activate uh, the signaling pathway. So uh, Rig I MDA5 will activate MAVs, which is found on the outer surface of the mitochondria and also peroxisomes. And this activation leads to, uh, well, expression of, uh, well, activation of uh, this TBK, TBK, I think it's called tank binding kinase, will activate IRF3, essential for the activation of interferon genes here and nf kappa b yeah that's something i didn't mention here right so one big difference here type 1 interferon signaling for the tlr 7 8 9 and 3 which is not the case for the clr and not the case for tlr 2 and tlr 4 well, tlr 4 maybe a bit but so you're activating the interferon system by these nucleic acid sensing systems so how can Rig I and MDA5 discriminate between viral RNA and normal RNA that's in the cytoplasm? Well, we understand this pretty well for Rig I because it would only bind short RNAs with triphosphate or diphosphate at the five prime extremity of the RNA molecule. And you don't generally find that in host cell RNAs because uh, mRNAs have got a five prime cap and ribosomal and tRNAs, when they're matured before they're exported from the nucleus, they only have a monophosphate group at the five prime end. So that's what makes Rig I specific for uh, non-host RNA. Um, 
MDA5 binds to long double-stranded RNA, which you generally don't get from host uh, genes. But a lot of viruses, and especially RNA viruses, will replicate via a double-stranded RNA intermediate, and this can activate MDA5. So these two uh, detectors are really essential for activating type 1 well, type 1 interferon expression in infected cells, cells infected by RNA viruses. Okay, so what about DNA viruses? Well, for DNA viruses, one of the main systems is the SIGA sting pathway. So this was discovered more relatively recently. So here, the main actor is the C-gas, or the detector of double-stranded DNA is C-gas, which stands for um, cyclic GMP-AMP synthase. So uh, C-gas will bind a double-stranded DNA in the cytosol, and when it's activated, it will take GTP and ATP and bind them together to give you this dinucleotide, cyclic GMP AMP. And then cyclic GMP AMP is a kind of like a secondary messenger which will bind to the uh, signaling intermediate called STING, so which is stimulator of interferon genes. That's what that stands for. Once again, it's membrane bound. Uh, associated with the endoplasmic reticulum, and it will activate the same kind of signaling pathway as rig i like receptors. So you've got these TBK1, IKK, so you get interferon, expression of interferon-stimulated genes and expression of NF-kappa B, and you get inflammation. Now, there's two things that are kind of interesting about C- GMP, AMP. All right, let me just correct that because it's got S here, right? That's not right. Cyclic GMP, AMP. So two interesting things about C-GAMP. One of them is it's a small molecule, right? So it can diffuse into neighboring cells. And that means that cells that are nearby but aren't infected, they can start uh, activating NF-kappa B and interferon and the interferon response. So that's pretty good. So you get amplification of the uh, of the danger signal. And the other thing which is really cute is that it can also be packaged into virus particles that are released from the infected cell. So when these virus particles go and infect some other cell, it's going to release C-GAMP into the newly infected cell, and that will start up um, expression of the interferon-related genes and NF-kappa B-dependent genes in a cell right at the beginning of the infectious process, just as soon as the virus gets in. So that's a very clever system. And, okay, essential for activating the interferon response in cells infected by DNA viruses because you basically don't have any double-stranded DNA in the cytosol of a normal, healthy cell. Okay, so it's DNA in the wrong place, which is the signal here. Now, another cytoplasmic detector of DNA are the, is, uh, are the AIM-2-like receptors. So AIM-2, once again, binds double-stranded DNA in the cytosol. And once this happens, then the AIM-2 molecule will start to polymerize along the double-stranded DNA. So the DNA is going to bind to this HIN domain here. So you start to get polymerization of AIM-2. And this will give you polymerization of the pyrin domain, which will recruit this adapter protein called ASC. Uh, ASC stands for apoptosis-associated spec-like protein containing a CARD, a caspase activation recruitment domain. So the polymerization of AIM-2 around the DNA will recruit ASC, and ASC's polymerization is what's going to be essential for 
recruiting and activating caspase one. So caspase one, everybody knows what caspases are, right? Yeah, cysteine aspartate uh, proteases. And the essential role for, of caspase one in inflammation is to convert the precursor of interleukin one beta, pro IL one beta, into the biologically active form, IL one beta. So this proteolytic cleavage of pro IL one beta, which will mature, mature it into the active cytokine. This is in the cytoplasm of the cell, so it's got to be released outside to give an inflammatory signal. And this is the function of gasdermin, which is also cleaved by caspase 1, which will form pores, which allow the uh, active IL-1 beta to be released from the cell. So there's two complementary but different roles of uh, CGAS sting and AIM-2. Okay, so CGAS sting is going to activate the interferon system. It's going to activate the expression of pro-inflammatory genes through NF-kappa B. Among them is going to be IL-1 beta, which is going to be expressed in the infected cell. But without AIM-2, this IL-1 beta can't be released. Okay, so to get a full inflammatory response, you need both things. You need to express the genes and you need to have an uh, activation of uh, a a AIM-2 and uh, ASC and the inflammasome. So AIM-2... Oh yeah, okay. And so there's four human AL ALRs, but only AIM-2 can activate the inflammasome. But the others are also involved in, in, in uh, detecting uh, DNA in infected cells. Okay, so uh, AIM-2 specificity compared to CGAS sting or the rig eye like receptors is that it can activate the inflammasome. But it's not the only molecule that it does this. So the other pathogen, pathogen recognition receptors that activate inflammasomes are the NOD-like receptors. So NOD is for nucleotide binding oligomerization domain. And this is a family of intracytoplasmic receptors with several subfamilies. So you've got NLRB, NLRC, NLRP, and NLRA. They all have this kind of LRR, once again, a leucine-rich region, which is what is forming the structure that recognizes specific pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So the pathogen recognition module, it's kind of like the toll-like receptors, okay? The same kind of LRR structure that forms kind of a hook. Now, the, okay, so uh, NLRA actually doesn't recognize any pathogens. It's a transcription, transcriptional regulator which uh, activates class 2 uh, HLA expression. But the others all have some kind of pathogen recognition function. So some of the um, molecules that they recognize are listed here. So NLRB, so NAIP, will recognize uh, flagellin. Uh, NOD1 recognizes DAP, uh, NOD, no, yeah, that's right. Not two recognizes the muramal dipeptide. Everybody know what that is? N-acetyl muramic acid and N-acetyl glucosamine, the repeating subunit of peptidoglycan. That's also recognized by NLRP1, peptidoglycan, and NLRP2, to name several, several different pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So DAP, you have to remember your microbiology here. This is diaminopimelic acid, a very unusual amino acid only uh, found in the crosslinks in uh, peptidoglycan. Okay, so these ones, NOD1, NOD2, and NLRP1, they're really detecting bacterial cell wall components inside the cell. So if you've got any of these things inside the cell, it's not normal you have been infected by some kind of bacterium. And that's why you need to activate an immune response. 
Okay, so not one and not two, they don't activate the inflammasome, they activate an NF-kappa B pro-inflammatory pro genes. And well, kind of interestingly, if you have a gain of function mutation in NOD1 and, or NOD2, that is these molecules are constitutively active, then you get um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. This is supposed to be CD, Crohn's disease, not CBD. Let me just correct that as well, that's kind of wrong. Crohn's disease, yes. So you have a, you, so that means that there's a kind of like systematic overreaction to commensal gut microbes in the uh, gut microbes, and this leads to the chronic inflammation. Now, most of the NLR uh, receptors will activate the inflammasome, and once again, they do this by recruiting the ASC adapter protein. So what's going to happen is either the um, card domain or the uh, Pyrin domain of these NLRs will recruit uh, ASC, and that in turn will lead to polymerization and recruitment of the uh, procaspase one. So this leads to, you know, cleavage of IL-1 beta, uh, cleavage of gastermin, uh, so release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, and also the death of the cell by pyroptosis. So uh, inflammatory cell death. Okay, so that's really as much as probably anybody wants to know about uh, pathogen recognition receptors. So we've got about, what is it, 20 minutes left to wind up here and try and do the rest of the lecture. So yeah, anyway, so I've put a lot of time on this because it's really important. This is the first step. You've got to recognize you've been infected. Once that's happened, then your immune system can actually do something. So what are the types of responses? Well, innate responses and then adaptive responses. Innate responses, well, they're rapid, they're fast. They've got some kind of specificity. So the different kind of effectors will be activated against different types of pathogens. And there are, you know, cellular and humoral components. So we'll have a look at these uh, uh, different types of effectors, but really not really going from humoral and cellular, First, I think we'll look rather at what types of pathogen activate what kind of innate effectors. So for, oh yeah, and the, and the other thing is, you know, in amongst all of these things, you know, you've got inflammation plays a key role. So one of the things that is, is, is going to happen, whatever kind of pathogen PRR is activated, is you get some key inflammatory mediators that are expressed by dendritic cells or, or macrophages. IL-1, beta, IL-6, and TNF-alpha are the major ones. So they're going to have some systemic effects, like uh, induce the infection and the expression of the acute phase proteins. And they're going to cause fever by their effects on the hypothalamus. They're going to have effects on endothelial cells, locally or systemically. So if you have reduced uh, local blood pressure, then and increased permeability, this will help cells of the immune system, neutrophils and lymphocytes to actually infiltrate the site of the infection. So that's good. You kind of like make the, the vascular system more open to cells to come in and control the, uh, the, 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 the pathogen that's at the particular site. So also they have, these have an effect on neutrophils by activating them and like mobilizing them from the bone marrow. Now, because they play such an important role, there have been a number of different molecules, biologicals, developed to try and like damp them down and inhibit them. Okay, so either monoclonal antibodies or soluble forms of their receptors. So there's several of them which have been licensed and are used to treat chronic inflammatory diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, so that's the, the kind of dysfunctioning of these pathogen recognition receptors and activating inflammation in a kind of um, non-optimal way. However, there really hasn't been much application of these kind of inhibitors to treat infectious diseases. Okay, so maybe Antoine will tell you about this a bit more next week. But So there have been kind of use of uh, tocilizumab and, and a Kinra 
to treat severe COVID-19 cases. Uh, I don't really want to talk too much about that, but I think the Cochrane reviews on this are a little bit divided. Uh, I don't know if there's a real consensus to say that there's a really, really useful. You've got some clinical trials show very good effects, others not so much. So, uh, you know, too much information can be a bad thing. Okay, so innate responses against particulate antigen or extracellular pathogens, bacteria or, or fungi. One of the things that is going to be really important is the complement system. Okay, so if you remember, uh, activation of complement is going to lead to really to three main things that are important. Deposition of the C3B fragment on the surface of the cells that have activated the complement. This will lead to opsonization so that the whatever pathogen it is can be phagocytosed and destroyed. C5A, the fragment will be released. It's a chemotractant. So you'll get of phagocytes being attracted to wherever complement has been activated. And the last thing, of course, is the membrane attack complex, the MAC, which will actually lyse cells. Gram-negative bacteria and protozoa can be lysed by the membrane attack complex. So these are like three very important effector mechanisms that, that can kill or allow pathogens to be cleared. Now, how do you activate the complement system? Well, uh, also, as everybody should remember, the classical pathway activated by antibodies, so that's part of the adaptive system, but it's also activated by the pentraxins. Okay, so C-reactive protein, CRP, and SAP, these are pentameric proteins synthesized by the liver in response to IL-6 principally. So these are some of the main serum markers of inflammation. Everybody's going to get your CRP dosed in the blood because it goes from like nothing to like 1,000 times higher very, very quickly if you've got an inflammation. So CRP and SAP, these are also pattern recognition receptors which bind to phosphoralcholine and phosphoralethanolamine. So they're on the outside of bacteria and some fungi and also on damaged cells and they'll activate complement by the classical pathway. Another thing that's important are, is the lectin pathway. Uh, you know, mannose binding lectin and the fecolins will activate complement. Once again, you know, it's mannose, extra, a lot of uh, mannose glycans on the outside of cells are not really normal. Either these cells have been damaged, their glyc glycosylation pathways are not functioning correctly, or there's some kind of pathogen. So this will allow the activation of a uh, recruitment of complement and activation. And apparently this seems to be the ancestral pathway of complement recognition. So very, very simple vertebrates, they might not have antibodies, they might not have the classical pathway, but they have uh, the lectin pathway. And the other thing which is actually very clever is the alternative pathway, the preparedin pathway, and which occurs because you've always got some kind of spontaneous turnover of C3 in the complement pathway. So you're always getting some C3B deposited on any kind of biological surface. But host factors inhibit full complement activation. So this C3B is going to be removed and inactivated on a normal cell surface or on an endothelial surface. And this is related to the presence of CD46 and factor H. Factor H binds specifically to sialic acid. So if you've got any sialic acid on the surface of a you know, biological surface in your body, that's going to inhibit complement activation. If you don't have sialic acid, complement will be activated and then these pathogen or this kind of membrane will be attacked. So sialic acid, relatively recent addition to sugar biology, so no, well, some pathogens have it because they've evolved to try and hide, but most pathogens don't have any sialic acid on their glycoproteins. So they can activate the complement by the alternative pathway without any specific recognition of what they have on their surface. It's just like they don't have sialic acid, so they're foreign. Okay, so other so the cellular arm of innate responses to extracellular bacteria and fungi really depend a lot on neutrophils. Okay, so these are phagocytes which are going to 
come along and kill uh, bacteria, yeast, parasites, fungal spores. And these are going to be the first responders to the site of inflammation. There's lots of them floating around in the blood, just waiting to get the signal from chemokines, platelet activating factor, some cytokines like IL-17. Then they'll be uh, primed. They'll adhere to endothelial cell surfaces, uh, cross the endothelial cell, move into the uh, site of inflammation, and their other signals will activate them. And this will allow them to phagocytose particulate pathogens and then kill them by uh, producing reactive oxygen species through the expression and activation of NADPH oxidase. And they'll also do something which is very kind of weird, which is they release nets. And nets are neutrophil extracellular traps, which are what? Which are, it's like the nucleus of the neutrophil is going to be exocytose expelled. And you get a lot of high molecular weight DNA, which is just thrown out of the neutrophil. Right? It's like it's vomiting out its own DNA here. And this creates a kind of, large region of high molecular weight DNA, which is going to trap bacteria. And this is important for bacterial killing, because if you add DNAs to a kind of mix of bacteria neutroph and neutrophils, so the DNAs is going to break down these nets, where the killing of the bacteria is much less efficient. So it's an important part of the, you know, response or, or the effective functions of neutrophils. Now, neutrophils, are, are they important? Very important, because there is a, you know, a, a congenital deficiency of NADPH oxidase. So neutrophils exist, but they can't produce reactive oxygen species, and they don't produce nets. And young boys who have this uh, disease, because it's X-linked, they'll have chronic granulomatous disease, so recurrent bacterial or fungal infections because their neutrophils aren't capable of efficiently killing pathogens. So if, that, if you don't have this branch of your immune system, that's what happens to you, get recurrent bacterial and fungal infections. Okay, I've got 10 minutes. So I think what I'll probably do is just do the innate response and we'll have to stop there, I guess. Uh, I'll try and record and put up on my doc the what I have prepared on the adaptive response, but it's shorter anyway, so it'll probably be about 10 or 15 minutes extra. So I'll finish on time today and then record what, whatever is left. Okay, so for viruses, the innate effectors that are important are very, very different. Okay, so in terms of soluble effectors, it's the interferon system that is really essential. So interferons, you've got three types of interferons, types one, two, and three. And they are organized that way because they all, type 1, type 2, and type 3 interferon receptors will be, uh, interferons will bind to different types of receptors. So, and they have different sources as well. Okay, so type 2 interferons expressed by T cells and NK cells, that's interferon gamma. Type 3 interferon, that's interferon lambda secreted by epithelial cells. Type 1 interferons, interferon alpha all the different subtypes, beta, and then the other ones. So type interferon alpha secreted specifically by plasmacytoid dendritic cells. And interferon beta expressed by any kind of cell after infection. Okay, so that's RLRs, uh, Cgas sting will be inducing the expression of interferon beta. So what they have in common is that binding of interferons to the receptors will start signaling through the interferon receptors and induce the expression of what are called ISGs, interferon stimulated genes. And each of these, these ISGs have direct antiviral effects in infected cells. So there are about 500 of them. So it's about 2% of our you know, genome coding capacity is dedicated to the interferon system. That's, you know, a fair bit. So 
direct antiviral effects. So the, the whole point of the interferon system is to protect cells that aren't yet infected and to make them more resistant to viral infection. And this works because different ISGs are active about different stages of the virus replication cycle. So there are some ISGs that will inhibit membrane fusion between envelope viruses and cellular membranes. Some will inhibit uh, decapsidation. Uh, others will inhibit replication. I'll put this in the wrong place. Trim 5 alpha should be up with decapsidation. And some will inhibit uh, virus release. Now, other ISGs will target viral genomes for mutation or uh, destruction. So the OAS RNA ZEL system, very important for destroying the RNA of uh, uh, RNA viruses. The APOBEC system will be <laughs> inducing mutations in inactivating uh, viral genomes. So what happens if you don't have a functioning interferon system? Well, there are some uh, rare recessive mutations in STAT1. So STAT1 is the essential signaling adapter for all of the interferon receptors. So type 1, type 2, and type 3 interferon receptors will activate these uh, tyrosine kinases, uh, JAK1, JAK2, and TIK2, uh, which will phosphorylate these transcription factors STAT1 and STAT2 and either dimers, homodimers of STAT1 or STAT1, STAT2 heterodimers are what are going to activate the expression of these ISGs. So type 1 and type 3 interferons will activate both STAT1 homodimers and STAT1, STAT2 heterodimers, whereas interferon gamma will only be inducing the expression, well, inducing the formation of activated STAT1 homodimers. So if you've got no STAT1, then you don't have any functioning interferon response. And the uh, young people who have these disease uh, found were identified because they were susceptible to mycobacterial inf infections. So these were young children who got their BCG vaccination, which, if, as you know, is a live attenuated mycobacterium. Now, most of us, we just like react to this, eliminate the bacterium, we get like resistance. But these children, they couldn't control the, uh, the um, division and growth of this uh, vaccine strain. So they got my, a systemic mycobacterial disease from the vaccine because they didn't have any functioning interferon system. And so they were cured from, uh, because by antibiotic therapy, but then went on to develop fatal viral infection. So this is very rare. There's only like two or three cases in the, in the literature. Well, there's, there's more than that now, but there were two or three index cases. So, so that, that's telling you interferon responses essential for controlling intracellular bacterial infections. Okay, mycobacteria, they're intracellular and also viral infections. Now, there's another thing that's kind of interesting about this is that there are also gain of function mutations in the STAT1 gene. So these are people who've got an overactive interferon response, okay? And that's actually not great either because these people uh, suffer from a chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. So that's telling you that there's some antagonism between interferon and TH17 immunity. You know, so if you overactivate your interferon response, you'll have really great defense against intracellular bacteria and viruses, where well, you're not going to do so great against fungal infections. Okay, so you've got to activate the right kind of response to the right kind of pathogen. Okay, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about this interferon and uh, viral diseases. I've got a couple of minutes. So the importance was really shown recently by uh, the, uh, the identification of rare mutations in different components of the interferon system in adult patients with a severe form of COVID-19 infection. So they were found in, you know, 3.5% of um, patients with severe COVID-19 compared to uh, patients with mild symptoms. Also TLR7 deficiency. So this is an X-linked a genetic condition found in about 1% of men with uh, life-threatening COVID-19 who were rather younger, so they didn't have like the age-related risk factor. And also mutations in the interferon signaling system 
were found in a proportion of children hospitalized for COVID-19 pneumonia. Because as you know, you know, children generally have a mild form of uh, COVID-19. But there are some case, severe cases in children, and about 10% of them here were related to mutations either in TLR7, interferon alpha-1 receptor, or these signaling molecules, STAT2 or TIC2. So having a functionally interferon type 1 response, really important for preventing these severe forms of COVID-19. And the other thing that was essential here is you can have a kind of phenotypic knockout of your immune system uh, if you develop autoantibodies against interferon alpha. And this will be a kind of functional knockout, okay? So you genetically, you're okay. You've got interferon alpha, you've got TIC2, so you've got uh, STAT2, you've got interferon alpha receptors. But if you've got autoantibodies, then these interferons can never activate their receptors. So this was a big paper published in Science 2020 with a big consortium, Jean-Laurent Casanova is the last author. So this is the guy who's really behind a lot of these studies on rare variants in the human population being related to uh, you know, severe forms of disease. So it was also his team that did these studies and also some of the other ones that I, I presented. So here they had like, you know, cohort of patients with very severe disease compared with a cohort of patients with you know, asymptomatic or mild COVID-19, and they dose the anti-interferon antibodies in the plasma of these patients. So you've got uh, the, you know, the uh, ELISA, well, okay, some kind of like a measurement of the anti antibodies here against alpha-2 or, or omega interferon. So only the patients with severe COVID-19 have got these antibodies, very, very few in people with asymptomatic infections. And overall, they have these anti-interferon antibodies in like maybe 10 to 14% of patients with uh, critical COVID-19. And the difference in these numbers depends on the kind of the, the threshold of detection. If you've got a very sensitive assay, then it's about 14%. If your assay is a little bit less sensitive, it's about 10%. And also found in about 18% of the people who died. Okay, so having a function so if you put these things together you've got anti auto antibodies and rare mutations in the genes involved in the interferon signaling pathway you're talking about this is kind of responsible for maybe 15 to 20 percent of all the severe cases and probably a similar amount of all the deaths of people so you know that's how important having a functional uh, interferon system is in an acute viral infection Okay, so I think that's probably a good place to stop. And what I will do is I'll try and record the rest. It's only going to be about 10 slides to finish up, maybe 15. So I'm not going to talk so much about the rest. And I'm sorry I went over time. This is the first year I've been doing this lecture, so I put in perhaps a bit too much stuff. So I'd be happy to sit around if anybody has any questions before switching over to the next class. Okay, well, goodbye everybody, and remember next time somebody says stage in Shanghai, don't hesitate to ask for extra information, because you might have been able to go if you just dared. <laughs> <laughs>